they discovered upon their arrival was almost unspeakable. We are all evil in some form or another. I'm not guilty. <laughs> the dead won't bother you. It's the living you gotta worry about. Some, if I couldn't keep them there with me whole, I, at least I felt that I could keep uh, their skeletons. Hello and welcome to the Bad Taste Crime Podcast. I'm Vicky. And I am Janelle. We're back again for a great episode. We are, I'm actually more awake than I have been because we're doing an evening recording, which is not something that's like normal never do. Yeah. <laughs> for us at all. I, in fact, I think I said, I don't know that in the like four years that we've been doing this, that we've ever done an evening recording. We did when we did the crossover episode with, yeah, it's only when we've done crossover episodes. Yes, because we've done a couple crossover right. episodes way but go way back in time when we were just baby podcasters. We did a couple with some yes. people in Ohio, and then when we did um, when we went out to Rockford, that was a very late one. <laughs> that's right. Okay, that's why that one got so wild. I think. I think so too. We had some beverages <laughs> and we talked about ghosts, and you know how we get when we talk about yeah. ghosts. We get very hyped. <laughs> yes, true. <laughs> Ghost oh my god, that was so fun. But we are back again this week. I'm feeling very energized and I'm ready to talk about crime uh, a lot. But first, <laughs> let's head over to the newsroom. So this week... Our news comes to us from Sri Lanka, from France Whoa. 24. Okay. Yes. <laughs> I know. Expanding our horizons a little bit here. All the way across all the ponds. <laughs> yes. So Sri Lanka has issued a slew of new laws in regards to the treatment of captive elephants, which is something awesome. that sounds kind of weird to us, but elephants are used over there for a lot of work mm-hmm. and they're they're used as work animals um but they're also kind of like a status symbol uh people keep elephants to show off their wealth you know people used to use them for war yes They'd ride elephants instead of horses <laughs> yeah so the goal of these is to allow people to continue doing that but provide better treatment for the animals themselves so I thought this would be interesting because, Janelle, you are definitely an animal lover, I would say. This is true. Mm-hmm. So let's see here. <laughs> um, official records show that there are about 200 domesticated elephants in the South Asian nation with the population in the wild estimated at about 7,500. Uh, so one of the new laws will require all owners to ensure that animals under their care have new photo identity cards with a DNA stamp. Okay. (laughs) And then it brings a bunch of working regulations for, or regulations for working elephants. So one is that you can't use baby elephants for work anymore. That's great. (laughs) And they can't be separated from their mothers. Even better. (laughs) <laughs> also great logging elephants cannot be worked for more than four hours a day and they are not allowed to work at night sounds good they have really bad night vision did you know that they do not have <laughs> night vision they they have bad night vision oh i didn't know that but that kind of yeah. makes sense <laughs> there's also some new restrictions on the tourism industry as well so at this point nobody you can't you can't put more than four people on the back of an elephant, and the saddle has to be like extra padded, well padded. They are not allowed to be used in films. Good. What about circuses? <laughs> it doesn't say anything about circuses, but I don't know if they're used as much in circuses over there. Do you think? I don't know. I've never been to Sri Lanka, so I'm not sure. <laughs> I, they use them a lot for tourism, so I would yeah. I mean, not just carrying tourists around. You know, I feel like yes, they do like yeah. tricks, and there's like a whole series of elephants that paint. Huh. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, but I know that 
so their use in film is banned except for government productions under very strict veterinary supervision. And people, this was the big draw, is that you're no longer allowed to drink and ride an elephant. That sounds reasonable. No drunk elephant riding. Um, And you can't consume any harmful drugs while you are, like, riding an elephant for work. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so that's fun. They have to send their animals for medical checkups every six months, and anyone who violates the new law will have their elephant taken into state care, and they could face up to three years in prison. That's good. Yeah, I, I've actually read a little, not specifically Sri Lanka, but like a little bit about um, the tourism industry and elephants, and the fact that a lot of times um, when they have elephants that they're used for like uh, tourism where they're carrying people around on their backs. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, what is it, it like reduces their lifespan by 10 years or something ridiculous. What? Um, because they, really? yeah, because they will basically break their back. They're not, their backs are not made to carry, uh, the, the little saddles and that kind of weight in the curve of their back. Mm-hmm. So, um, it reduces their life expectancy because it basically, it's like IVDD in dogs. Yeah. It just like disintegrates their spine. So don't ride oh elephants, gosh. guys. <laughs> like shake hands no with idea. their trunk, but like don't ride them. <laughs> yeah. I had no idea. Yeah, it's pretty fucked up. <laughs> so I knew you would be a good person to talk about this yeah. with. You just know a lot of these things. <laughs> yeah, I just, I, I listen to too much stuff. <laughs> too many podcasts, too much NPR. It's just, you know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, speaking <laughs> of consuming content, let's head over to Netflix and Kill. We're we talking about, thank you, <laughs> solid. I've had a lot of practice. Um, we're talking about Memories of a Murder, the Nielsen tapes. Ooh, so I have not seen this, this yet. Oh, I will be honest. I'm not sure if you're going to like it or not. Okay. It could potentially go either way. I really enjoyed it. Um, so it is a documentary. It's like an hour 26, I think. Which I feel like is kind of nice because we do watch a lot of series on this show where mm-hmm. it's like four episodes, eight yeah. episodes. Yeah, I don't have that kind of time anymore. So an hour and a half yeah. is perfect. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so this was just recently added. It's a documentary that looks at the full timeline of Dennis Nielsen, who is a British serial killer who lured young men who are often like transient or like down on their luck kind of guys back to his home where after they fell asleep, he would strangle them to death and then dismember their bodies and put them under his floorboards or burn their bodies in a bonfire. He's often con- compared to John Wayne Gacy, mm-hmm. but like the UK's version. Yeah. I think in total it was about 15 or 16 young men and boys this documentary is kind of unique because it's told from both the perspective of the people involved as well as nielsen himself who recorded himself while he was incarcerated so after he was convicted of all of these murders he in the beginning they talk about him wanting to write this memoir or like autobiography and trying to do that so i think the tapes were made to sort of contribute to that but i don't believe that was ever completed or finished for you know obvious moral reasons like Mm -hmm. you know we have i I don't know what the laws are in the uk about that but i know here like you can't do shit that's gonna profit off of your crimes especially if you're still incarcerated so that's i don't think that happened but so they have all of these recordings of nielsen basically telling his story uh, from his childhood all the way up through when he was arrested. Um, The murders took place between 1978 and 1983. And Nielsen was only discovered after neighbors had called about clogged pipes. Um, And then like there was body parts discovered within the clogged, clogged pipes. They went in and talked to him and he pretty much confessed to everything right away. Hmm. And they had originally said, So it's interesting because in the documentary they say, so like, what do we have here? Like two, are we talking like two or three people? And he says like 15 or 16. They're like, oh, "Oh, fuck. Okay. (laughs) Uh, What do we do with this? So 
it's it's i think the way that they filmed it and the way it's kind of put together is really interesting and really compelling and it's because you're like hearing from the murderer himself it brings another layer to it i think there's always of course like that you do kind of have to like take what he says with a grain of salt Mm -hmm. because there is some facts about like his upbringing and stuff that are kind of disputed a little bit, but I definitely think it's worth a watch, especially at like an hour and a half, you know, it's a really interesting story. Yeah, it's great. You should check it out. It's very rare that we have something that you haven't watched yet. (laughs) Yeah. I was, I've been on a kick watching, um, we went on a trip and I watched a bunch of, series of um it's the smiley face killer's daughter uh melissa moore she has a tv show uh the killer my family whatever the hell it's called um i watched a bunch of episodes of that so that's what i was binging (laughs) she's got a podcast as well that's really really good well the tv show is she connects with other children or um family members of serial killers she spoke with john wayne gacy's sister um, and they met with one of his victims' family members. So she brings victim and serial killer family members together to talk about how, you know, that crime or case has affected their families. And a lot of times, like, the serial killer's, you know, children or whatever apologize. And the other people are like, well, you didn't do anything wrong, <laughs> you know? Right, right. <laughs> but it is, yeah, you know, the, a lot of guilt. <laughs> the podcast is actually the same thing, but she... Did her, and now that there's a TV, I have, honestly, I haven't listened to it in a couple seasons, but like the very first season that she did was her going out and searching for the like sons and daughters and family members of the victims of her father and Mm -hmm. trying to like reconnect and like heal a little bit and kind of reckon with a lot of the stuff that she was feeling and feeling guilt and all of the stuff from her dad. Really, really good. Really, really good. I would I would probably suggest both of those, I think. <laughs> yeah, it was interesting. Got sucked into a hole. <laughs> oh, oh my god, I can only imagine. Okay, so at this is that part of the show where we say content may not be appropriate for all listeners. We are gonna be talking about instances of murder. <laughs> yep. That's what we do on this show. Because <laughs> that's what we do. So I will start out today. Um, We're going to be talking about a man named Abraham Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. Did you tell us what we were talking about? Oh, yes. Sorry. So we are talking (laughs) about... We skipped over that. (laughs) Yeah, I'm just like jumping right into it. So Mm -hmm. we're talking about cases that were solved with the help of amateur sleuths. Because I think I've been seeing a lot recently about amateur sleuths. You hear a lot about web sleuths of course yes. mm-hmm. i mean we've we've definitely made mention of sleuths before we've definitely said when in doubt sleuth it out so <laughs> yes and i think there is something to be said for especially you know with the invention of the internet like connecting everybody right people regular people have a lot more time to <laughs> devote to going down some of these rabbit holes in cases that I think regular investigators and detectives do not necessarily have. Mm -hmm. They may have the resources, but like the fact that you have multiple cases and you have to juggle resources and kind of like, you know, I hate to say it, but like pick and choose where you're going to spend your time. Yeah. You know, like it is super beneficial uh, to be able to leverage this kind of, I don't know, like force of people to like help. I mean, and I think there are some, some police forces who would not necessarily consider this a good thing. And it's more just like people getting in the way Mm -hmm. (laughs) a little bit. And I think there is some of that too, right? It kind of comes with two sides of the coin, especially when you're talking about specifically like internet sleuthing, right? Yeah. Yeah. But I just find it interesting when you have like a regular average Joe being able to add something to a case that really breaks it wide open, right? Mm -hmm. So that's what we're talking about today. So I will be talking about Abraham Shakespeare, as I've said before I skipped right over everything else. Um, (laughs) So Abraham Shakespeare was a Central Florida man who was in his 40s, and he was just this kind of average 
minimum wage laborer. He grew up in Lake Wales and he did, when he was younger, spend some time in homes for juvenile delinquents and later extended his criminal record a little bit, but it was mainly charges of like loitering or driving without a license or stealing. It wasn't anything like too major. I consider all of those very might like loitering. Yeah. <sighs> Whatever. Anyway, <laughs> in November 2006, he and a co-worker named Michael Ford stopped at the Town Start Mini Mart on their way to Miami for a delivery. Ford asked Shakespeare if he wanted anything from inside, to which he asked Ford to buy two quick pick lottery tickets. And then when Ford returned to the truck, he was given $2 out of a five that Shakespeare had in his wallet. I know this is going to sound like, why are you including these details? But trust me, it does come into play later. <laughs> <laughs> so when the numbers were read that evening, Shakespeare discovered that he had won the jackpot of $31 million, mm. he decided to take the lump sum of $17 million after taxes, um, which is kind of like, this is where the real trouble starts for him. Yeah. Also, I'm like, that's an absurd amount of taxes to take out, but... Well, it's free money. <laughs> right, exactly. I'm, I'm, I'm also like, I am never going to have that amount of money ever, so like, please... Take the taxes out. <laughs> so almost immediately, Shakespeare paid the government $9,000 in back child support payments. He also began gifting large sums of money to pay to various people in his life. There's a lot of debate about like whether this was out of generosity or whether people were taking advantage of him. Although, honestly, like I'm willing to bet it's a little bit of both. He was often described as like this really generous person, but like, I think it's inevitable when you have that amount, like suddenly have that amount of money for people to just like come out of the woodwork and be like, hey, remember me? Like, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm your long lost cousin three times removed. <laughs> yeah. Can I have a million dollars? So I definitely think it was a little bit of both things. Um, so Shakespeare's stepdad received $1 million. His three stepsisters received $250,000 a piece. He paid off a friend's $185, $85,000 mortgage and another $60,000 mortgage for another man from the neighborhood for who, like who he had known for many years. He also bought a $125,000 house that he decided to rent out to some tenants, gave his nephew's best friend $40,000, his mom $12,000, and his sister $10,000, along with many other like large cash gifts to a ton of other people. Hmm. <laughs> that seems like a lot. It is a lot. It is a lot, yes. And... I will say, like, he did buy himself a new house. It was a, uh, about, it was like a $1.1 million house in this gated community along with a couple new cars. But, like, and I think I saw a mention of, like, buying a Rolex, you know what I mean? Like, but he didn't really seem like he went too crazy on himself. He was just giving a lot of this money away. Now, three months after Shakespeare received the money, there was a lawsuit filed by Michael Ford, who was Shakespeare's former co-worker who had gone with him when he picked up the lottery ticket that day, claiming that some of the winnings should belong to him. Mm. He first approached Shakespeare and was like, yo, I bought that ticket for you. Give me a million dollars. And Shakespeare was like, no. So he decided to take him to court and claimed that the winning lottery ticket had been stolen out of his wallet. The case went to court and the jury sided with Shakespeare and ultimately get, Ford got nothing out of it except paying for like court costs and lawyer fees, right? Not, I mean, of course, like at this point, there wasn't really that much to give because much of the $17 million fortune had been spent or given away. So enter a woman named Dee Dee Moore who had 
contacted Shakespeare to say that she wasn't out for his money, but she actually wanted to assist him in managing the the money that he had left. Okay. Sounds legit, right? Kind of. <laughs> <laughs> So Moore had actually learned about Shakespeare through a colleague at a small business conference. The colleague, Barbara Jackson, had actually sh- sold Shakespeare the house in the gated community that he bought and told Moore how she had been inspired by the way that Shakespeare was just like giving a lot of his money away to his friends and his family. Um, Moore kind of saw this as an opportunity and offered to write a story on both Jackson and Shakespeare and asked Shake uh asked Jackson to set up a meeting between the three of them. This meeting led to Moore becoming Shakespeare's advisor and really taking over a lot of his life decisions including buying the house Moore bought the house from Shakespeare for $655,000 and then moved into this like uh, it was like this small house on the back of the property. So mm-hmm. he was still living in his house, but she owned it now. Okay. And the two of them started Abraham Shakespeare LLC. And she placed herself as the primary manager, which gave her control over all of his affairs and the debts that people owed him, which meant that those people now owed the debts to her. Okay. Now, around this time, Moore also divorced her husband of 17 years, and as the only person with access to Shakespeare money, she withdrew a million dollars from his account to purchase cars and other gifts for herself. All of this had happened within less than a year. They had, Moore and Shakespeare had not even known each other a year, but she, like, swooped in and just fully took advantage of the situation. Typical. (laughs) yeah yeah she is like the perfect example of somebody that like comes out of the woodwork to be like give me some money it was around this time right that shakespeare's he he like pretty much disappeared from public life and shakespeare's family had not seen him from April 2009 until about november was when they started becoming suspicious because at that point they had assumed that he was like on vacation or like sitting on a beach somewhere. He had just gotten all this money that assumed he would spend it like that. Right. So it did take them a while before they actually reported him missing. So of course, police went and questioned the woman who was living behind his house, who had insisted Uh (laughs) that she had aided Shakespeare um, in disappearing without a trace. Oh, God. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Moore claimed that he had been annoyed with people, constantly asking him for money, and just wanted to, like, get away. Like, didn't want anybody to find him. Now, this isn't to say that Shakespeare's family hadn't heard from him entirely, because they had still been receiving, like, text messages here and there. Mm -hmm. But the style of his texting had changed because you see Shakespeare was practically illiterate by all accounts. And all of a sudden he began sending these incredibly like coherent text messages, (laughs) which was part of the reason that his family got tipped off. Like, okay, there is something obviously different about just the text messages that we're receiving. So Moore had also attempted to pay various friends and relatives to claim that they had seen Shakespeare recently or that they had received communication from him. So while police are investigating, she's approaching all of these people to be like, I'll give you $100,000 if you say that you saw Shakespeare last week. Not Very sketch. sneaky. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Moore continued to maintain that she had assisted Shakespeare in disappearing, But this isn't, like, the type of thing that police are going to take on face value. And they continued investigating. Now, in the meantime, uh, the Internet's favorite armchair detectives, web sleuths, 
got wind of Shakespeare's disappearance and they began their own investigation. And I'm telling you, like, these people are serious. (laughs) They are. They're like almost too serious. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it has helped in a lot of cases, but like, if they pick up on something, like, the the folks over at Web Sleuths involved in various investigations are, I don't know, they're crazy. They just they just do really deep dives and will not let something go until they've figured it out. So they felt similar to the authorities um, and were sort of leaning towards more as being the most suspicious party of this whole story and more like they they felt like she had she knew a lot more than she was telling police so more got wind of this like online investigation and decided to go on to web sleuth and make her own profile and like made it anonymously and was going through great efforts to offer an alternative theory that Moore hadn't committed any crimes and that she was totally innocent and to sort of like provide this defense of herself anonymously from, you know, another supporter of hers. Uh Uh So Trisha Griffith, who is, um, she's a co-owner of Web Sleuth since 2004, decided to look into the IP address of the email associated with the account because she can do that, like she owns the website, and lo and behold, the account belonged to Dee Dee Moore, who they were investigating on the web. I just find that whole i like whole thing kind of silly. I don't know. <sighs> People just don't understand internet things. Like. They can figure out who this person is behind this anonymous email. (laughs) So this information uh, was immediately turned over to the authorities, which provided this huge jump in their investigation. They then received a tip to look in the backyard of Moore's home. And when they did, they discovered Shakespeare's body buried nine feet underground under a big concrete slab. Moore continued to try to cover her tracks by first claiming that he had been killed by drug dealers and going so far as to claim that he had been killed by one of his sons. But as her conviction seemed imminent, Moore then claimed that she had killed Shakespeare in self-defense before burying his body. Uh, Moore was arrested and charged with first-degree murder and possessing and discharging a firearm resulting in death. Prosecutors decided not to pursue the death penalty and instead tried for life uh, life in prison without the possibility of parole. The trial itself was like quite a scene as Moore broke down into tears several times saying she had gone into anaphylactic shock after taking Bactrim due to problems she was having with cuts on her ankles caused by being cuffed every day. Okay. <laughs> there is... I honestly, if you want to see some of the stuff, like they had cameras in the courtroom. It didn't seem like for the whole trial, but for some of these conversations she had with the judge, you can go on YouTube, search Dee Dee Moore, and it's it's pretty wild. She has this whole conversation where she's trying to explain to the judge about this anaphylactic shock that she had. Mm-hmm. And like her, I think her tongue was numb or maybe the implication was she she bit her tongue when she went into this anaphylactic shock, but she was like having problems speaking because of this maybe swollen tongue, I think. I don't know. It was very <laughs> strange. Yeah. The whole this deal. It's really weird. Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In fact, um, the judge in the case had to scold her multiple times for like making excessive gestures and excessive facial expressions during testimony which (laughs) sounds a little weird but it's like it's almost that thing that people do to get attention like these big over exaggerated like reactions to things right like big eye rolls and like sighs or like you know being really angry like what like it's that it was that kind of thing 
Now, the prosecution did play Moore's interrogation tapes during the trial. There's a couple of clips that I'm going to play for you. Both of them are from ABC Action News, but it really kind of illustrates this like constant shift in her stories that's just like all over the place. You'll definitely you'll get a real sense of her after uh after you hear these, I think. Goody. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so this is the first one. They're just two little short clips. Hours of questioning by Polk County investigators. Do I think that you're a cold-blooded killer? No, I, I hope you're not a cold-blooded killer. I have not killed him. I hope he's not even dead. He's not. Moore gave a wide variety of excuses why Abraham Shakespeare disappeared. Because he wanted to pretend that he was dying of AIDS so that he doesn't have to pay child support and people won't look for him if he's dying of AIDS. Then there was the blackmail excuse. It was a videotape of him having sex with a 14-year-old girl. Then came the tears. My family's being affected. My mom's got heart problems. She's over my house right now cleaning for Thanksgiving. They were My own parents were scared to come to my house for Thanksgiving. Why? Because of all this stuff happening. Well, how do they know about all this stuff? Because I'm, I'm honest with my family. But detectives didn't believe Moore was honest at all. I honestly can't look at you and believe a word that's come out of your mouth. Have you have no lied heart. and lied and lied. Have- One detective told the jury Moore even made a pass at him after the interrogation. She actually came toward me and she said that I wasn't going to get angry, that I was going to have sex with her. She said she was very attracted to me and hoped once her name was clear that I would pursue a relationship with her. Okay, so that's the first one. (laughs) Jesus, okay. (laughs) Yeah, she's... Oh my god, she is something else. Let's see here. Okay, so this is the second one. It's the bottom of the ninth, and you've got two strikes, Dee Dee. Okay. I watched Cedric shoot them. I was in the room. The one and only objective in this interrogation with Dee Dee Moore was to get the truth on what happened to Abraham Shakespeare. Moore started with this theory. It was a drug deal bot that went back, and the guy's name is uh, uh, something. I, I just found it out. Moore could not think of the drug dealer's name who supposedly killed Shakespeare. But with some persistence from detectives, it wasn't long before she scratched that idea and moved on to a new one. But I'm telling you, Cedric took the gun and in cold blood did not even hesitate to shoot the man. And I've seen it happen. Cedric is Shakespeare's cousin, who actually reported him missing back in the fall of 2009. As she watched it all in court, tears flowed. One heated moment came when she claimed she was being framed. Look at all the stuff you did, Dee Dee. Look at all the stuff you've done. If there's ever been some kind of cover-up, you did it on this case. I had to. Just when it looked like that was the end of the lies, the detective testified she had one more statement as she broke down and left the interrogation room. She said, my son RJ shot Abraham twice. Abraham was trying to choke me. RJ walked in the room, grabbed my gun, and shot him. He was only protecting me like any son would do. Okay. So. All over the place. (laughs) Yeah, that's just a little, like, taste of this. And honestly, that last one gets me because I'm like, the audacity to, when you're backed into a corner, to blame your own child? Mm -hmm. Like, I didn't do this. My kid did this. Like, I was honestly, like, really floored by that. I, I thought... Wow. Okay. She is willing to stop at nothing to get out of this bullshit that she did, right? So this entire time, Moore continues to claim innocence, and her defense team actually rested their case without calling any witnesses, and she did not testify herself. Good idea. (laughs) Yeah. The jury was not taken in by her constantly changing story, however, and on December 10th, 2012, found her guilty of all charges, sentencing Moore to life in prison without parole. Uh, So I would say she got what she deserved, for sure.
All right. So I I have an amateur sleuthy case that's um touches on a little bit of some stuff that I've covered before. So you know, we have covered um, missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls previously, so this is a case that is related to that. So not fun. No. <laughs> yeah, not the most, like, happy, sunshiny topic. Yeah, it's very current. Well, yeah, me, it's current. Yes, anyway. yeah. But 2017 is still current to me, okay? <laughs> it's, I mean, that's pretty current. Yeah. So on October 24th, 2017, a 33-year-old mother of four named Olivia Lone Bear disappeared. Lone Bear lived on a reservation in North Dakota. The reservation belongs to the Madan, Hadatsa, and Arakara Nation, which is more commonly known as the Three Affiliated Tribes, or MHA. It's kind of a lesser-known reservation. Um, Not many people know much about the ones in, like, North Dakota, South Dakota, Kansas, that area. She had left in her pickup truck um, in the afternoon and did not return. Now, we covered this before, but I'm covering it again because unfortunately, there are so many cases like this and it's often very hard to like read about it um, because the statistics are so staggering. 84% of Native American women experience some kind of violence in their lifetime, whether that be domestic violence um, or something like this where it's... Uh, they go missing or are murdered by someone outside the reservation. It's, um, that seems like extremely high. Okay. <laughs> yeah. There was a survey of 71 U S urban areas kind of reviewing the statistics of violence against native women, where they found that between 506 cases in 2010 and 2018 were of native women. Wow. 506 cases. Wow. That is too much. Yeah. And it's thought that women that live on tribal lands are actually 10 times more likely to be murdered. So if you're living within your own, like, reservation space, you're 10 times more likely to be murdered than if you lived off reservation, which you would think that would be the absolute opposite. Right. But it's really because of how the laws are set up with reservations and jurisdiction. So disappearances are not always kept on record. So data is scarce on actual figures of missing and murdered indigenous women. But in 2016, there were 5,712 reported cases worldwide. That's just one year. (laughs) So like (laughs) the the statistics are absolutely out of control. Yeah. This case in particular interested me because it involved extensive research and investigations by another local Native woman and a group of people that she put together. So Olivia Lone Bear's family reached out to reservation police because she had not returned home and she was not answering her phone. So the reservation police then had to reach out to local police. It's this very convoluted kind of thing that happens. So I have uh, put in, for some reason it wouldn't let me copy and paste it into our episode, but if you go into our drive, I do have it. and We can put it up for people to look at later, but there is this kind of like flow chart of okay. how it works when people are trying to contact the police. So If the person, this is how the jurisdictions work in the reservations on North Dakota. If the person is an Indian offender and their victim is Indian, it's a non-major crime. And so the tribal jurisdiction prevails. So they, if it's Indian to Indian, only the tribal jurisdiction is the way that it pans out. Okay. If they are an Indian offender and the victim is not Indian then usually it's joint between federal and tribal jurisdictions. Okay. If the person who is killing someone or assaulting someone, if they're not Indian and the victim is Indian, it's a federal jurisdiction. If they're on tribal land and they're not Indian and they kill someone who's also not Indian, it's state jurisdiction. Okay. So you have three you have three different courses of action yeah. that kind of are at play here. 
And then it also throws a wrench into it as well. If you're talking about murder or assault, if it's a major crime or a minor crime, that also can change the outcome of who takes care of it. So they reached out to the police and like every thousand (laughs) cases we cover, the police were just fucking it up left and right. So the tribal police stated that they could not investigate the case. It wasn't in their hands. It was, you know, not something that they could cover. Mm -hmm. Which is kind of weird because it's just a missing indigenous woman on tribal land. You would think the tribal jurisdiction would be at play. Now, her cousin, Matthew Lone Bear, stated um, in an article that I got this out of, uh, kind of like a great question. Um, Tribal police told us they couldn't investigate Libby's disappearance because there was no crime scene. Okay, but she's still missing. Uh, yeah, that doesn't really sound right. So there's really still something that's happening, <laughs> right? It doesn't sound right. So on top of that, you have all these jurisdictional issues, and eventually the case found its way over to the Bureau of Indian Affairs by February of the following year. It had worked its way all the way through, you know, to the the ultimate federal entity, which was the Bureau of Indian, Indian Affairs. Now, this is where our amateur sleuth enters, uh, Lisa Yellowbird. Um, and this is from an interview with The Sun. And I think that it's really important. I'm going to tell you a little bit about her background. Um, and I think it'll just give you an idea as to why she was so key to this case. Okay. Lisa, who is 50, suggests homelessness, undereducation, and sex trafficking are to blame for so many indigenous people vanishing. And the reason she's dedicated her life to finding the disappeared is because it so easily could have been her. At 15, Yellowbird ran away from home. She met a man who would eventually sex traffic her. This lasted for four months before she escaped to Minneapolis, Minnesota, where she enrolled in college, but soon dropped out after getting pregnant. She then found herself in and out of abusive relationships, eventually turning to drugs and becoming homeless. Her children were taken away and put into foster care which then Lisa turned to sex work in order to fund the fight to have them return to her. She even had a brief stint in jail. She knew she couldn't go on this way and began to train to be a legal advocate of Native women. Quote, My experience created the passion within me to have some compassion for the people who are missing. They are my people, my relatives. Around 2012, Yellowbird started getting serious about searching for missing women. She started realizing the problem locally and expanded her assistance nationwide. Uh, when she heard of Olivia Lone Bear's disappearance, she jumped into the investigation. Now, as her caseload started to grow, Lissa founded a group to help her, and this is called the Sunish Scouts. And she was doing this, she was getting this group together while she was looking for Olivia Lone Bear. And then she eventually quit her job to search for missing women full time. Wow. In a previous case that Yellowbird um, worked on, she searched for a non-Indigenous man who went missing in a similar fashion. So one of her first cases was a non-Indigenous man who went missing on Native land. The case went somewhere when the missing truck was located, so Yellowbird started with the truck that uh, Lone Bear was in. She's like, if we can figure out where the truck went, we can get a better idea of where she might have went to. Okay. Now, the area in North Dakota that Lone Bear went missing in is full of lakes. So, Lissa decided that she was probably going to find some luck kind of looking around in the lake area. That was her first thought. There's dirt roads and they just dead end in water. So, if she had an accident and went off the road, she could have wound up in a lake. Or if there was foul play, they could have gotten rid of her car in a lake. There's not a lot of places to hide cars in the middle of North Dakota. (laughs) Right. And if there's no reports of burned out vehicles, that would be the only other way, right? So like burning your vehicle, taking it out of state, or tossing it into a lake. So Lissa bought a boat with the last of her savings and started to drag the lakes in the area. The small boat came equipped with fishing sonar, which was kind of her secret weapon in this case. She went out on the water and, using the equipment, detected a rectangular shape on the muddy bed of a lake nearby. She went to the Mount Trail County Sheriff's Office, told them that she 
found something large and rectangular in the lake um, and wasn't sure what it was. And they actually were like, okay, we'll check it out. And they actually oh, fucking wow. did it, which is like super surprising. That's really surprising because I feel like normally they would just be like, so what? Yeah, cool. <laughs> yeah. So there was a truck submerged in 20, 21 feet of water, which was 400 feet from the shore. And this was on Sunnish Bay on Lake Sakakawea. I think I said that right. Um, and it was about one and a half miles from um, Olivia Lone Bear's home in Newtown. Okay. That truck belonged to Olivia Lone Bear. And wow. The truck had been on the bottom of this lake for nine months. And Olivia was found in the truck, buckled into the seat, but she was on the passenger side. Ooh, so, that's sketch. So automatically, kind of like, what is going on here? Yeah. Now, there wasn't a whole lot of other evidence in the truck. And Lone Bear's cause of death was actually ruled undetermined after an autopsy. Medical personnel couldn't find, uh, this is a quote from their, the um, autopsy report, definitive traumatic natural or toxicological causes for her death. So they couldn't figure out how she died at all. There was no, like, overt trauma. It didn't look like she died of natural causes, and there was nothing in her toxicology report to say that it was drug overdose or something. Or to account for the fact that she was buckled into the passenger seat. <laughs> Thankfully, though, the case was being treated by investigators as potential manslaughter foul play. Now, I put that there because a lot of times, as we have seen in many cases where people are found in their vehicles, that's not always the case. Right. A lot of times it's it's just like, uh, the foul play. Um, sometimes. <laughs> Most of the time it's like misadventure or something, which is so ridiculous. But that's kind of uh, one of the positive things about this is they immediately were like, this is, man, this, we're going for manslaughter with this one. Yeah. Now, search warrants indicated investigators sought Facebook and OnStar data um, revolving around Olivia Lone Bear. But by 2019, m- nothing really had happened on the case. Um, the FBI put up a $10,000 reward for any viable information. And actually, to date, the FBI, in conjunction with the United States Attorney's Office, has issued multiple investigation subpoenas and search warrants. Uh, FBI special agents have interviewed dozens of witnesses, conducted multiple forensic examinations on Lone Bear, and enlisted the support of several specialized law enforcement teams for their insight and expertise regarding missing um, indigenous women. Okay. Okay. Now interior secretary, Deb Holland, we've talked about her before. Um, yes. She opened up an investigation recently about the uh, residential schools in the United States. Um, she mm-hmm. actually announced on April 1st of this year that a new unit will be formed to assist tribal Bureau of Indian affairs and FBI investigators in cases like Olivia Lone Bears. So oh. they're putting together a special task force to help, figure out and curb the kind of just onslaught of missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. Okay. Very nice. The unit will work to help solve cold cases and immediately begin assisting agencies on ones that are currently active. And this will help to kind of streamline the process a bit and offer more resources to small, almost non-existent tribal police departments on reses. This car, this, the chart that I showed you kind of really just like goes over everything But what it's going to do is kind of eliminate that sort of weird process where you have to kind of like figure out the clues on who it's going to go to. Right. So now instead it's going to be across departments working together. So it's not going to be like, well, you have to deal with this. You have to deal with this. They're going to combine resources and everyone will take part in it. Yeah. I think it's definitely like pretty clear that system of, okay, well, if it's this, then this, if it's this, then this, whereas everywhere else in the United States, it's very clear on you live here, like, this is the jurisdiction, if it, you know what I mean? Like, and I think it probably has contributed to a lot of cases, either being mishandled or remaining unsolved, just because we couldn't get the jurisdiction right. Right. And on top of that, there is absolutely no resources that tribal, um, you know, the tribal police have. So Mm -hmm. the only way that they can really get help is if they get it from a federal agency. 
Right, right. So that's why it's really important for amateur sleuths like Lisa Yellowbird and organizations that she put together like the Sunnish Scouts to kind of jump in and get people to pay attention um, without people taking like to the streets and like protesting and putting up signs and holding the local authorities to task. There would be mm-hmm. no cases moving forward as opposed to like the handful that we've actually been able to see something move on. Yeah. So I want to end my story. They, you know, I wish that we had more information about Olivia Lone Bear. It's still under investigation. Hopefully this task force can kind of like get their shit together and figure it out. But I wanted to end with um, a suggestion of listeners to go and look up organizations to see how they can help. So if you're interested, the National Indigenous Women's Resource Center um, is a Native-led nonprofit organization, and they're dedicated to ending violence against Native women and children. They provide national leadership in ending gender-based violence in tribal communities by lifting up the collective voice of grassroots advocates and offering culturally grounded resources. So they offer technical assistance, training, policy development, and ways to strengthen tribal sovereignty. So giving tribes the, you know, backup to really say, hey, we need you to get in here. We need your help. You need to give us the resources. Um, another great uh, organization is Missing Murder Indigenous Women USA. Um, MMIW USA's number one mission is to bring home and help the families of the murdered to cope and support them through the process of grief. They offer hands-on support and guidance, and if they don't have the answers, they will seek answers so that families do not feel abandoned or alone in their struggle. And their broader goal is to eradicate the problem so that future generations can thrive. And then the last uh, organization that you can look into is the Coalition to Stop Violence Against Native Women. And their like little uh, informational clip, they said, to stop violence against Native women and children by advocating for social change in communities. We take ownership and responsibility for the future of Native women and children by providing support, education, and advocacy using their strength, power, and unity to create violence-free communities. So um, we'll put up the information and the websites that you can look into, but they offer a lot of um, training for people who want to get into helping uh, with advocacy. They offer legal assistance. They offer food, aid, clothing. A lot of them offer ways to um, get out of the places that you live, whether that be on a reservation or off a reservation. Um, So they, they help in a lot of ways. Uh, especially women who are in um, violent relationships, they will um, put up the money to get them a car, to get them out of the state and put them in a good job and get them away from those that are um, hurting them. So all of these organizations do very similar work, um, but they all have different resources and they're all in different parts of the country, but they're really good ways to kind of see what's going on, ways to get involved and just to just be more knowledgeable even about, what's going on because I mean, where we live, we don't even have a reservation. Um, yeah, we have a lot of, we do have a, a considerable amount of indigenous people in our area. Like there is a, an indigenous museum in Schomburg. Like we have a significant amount of people in the area, but we don't have like a reservation in Illinois. If you go over the border into Wisconsin, that's a different scenario. And you know, see like Minnesota and all that, but a lot of people are ignorant to it if there's not a reservation in the area. And even so, some people are just like, well, that's their problem. And they have a lot of misinformation about how tribal governments work and how tribal police work. So um, there's not a whole lot that they can do. uh, And that's why they need assistance. So yeah, that is the story. Well, if you need something to listen to while you are amateur sleuthing your way to solving a case uh why don't you check out this podcast i'm 
Lisa Lucas from Best Forevers, a podcast for kindred spirits. I'd like to start a movement where we spend more time loving on our friends because although friends are important to us, they're often in the shadow of other relationships. So if you want to love on your friendships a little bit more, embrace friendship a little bit more, or just appreciate your friendships a little bit more, then this podcast is for you. We'll explore all the different ways friendships take place share the amazing stories of friendship, and discuss best practices for the difficulties that friends may experience. It's time to embrace friendships because without our friends, who would we be? So check out Best Forevers on iTunes, Stitcher, and all the other podcasting listening venues. And be sure to follow Best Forevers Pod on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Well, Janelle, that has been our episode. Boy, howdy has it. (laughs) We have got a lot to talk about this week. I think we should probably start (laughs) with the newest thing, the most exciting thing. Yes. In case you haven't been on social media, because I know everyone is trying to get off of that. Power to you. But we are uh, the ambassadors now for Casting Whimsy Tea Shop. Uh, Casting Whimsy Tea Shop is out of Woodstock, Illinois. They are a adorable, cute little boutique tea store. Um, and if you love tea, or I mean, they have really amazing shortbread cookies. Holler, you better get one. Like lemony snickets are my favorite. Um, you can. I just love the name. <laughs> I know it's so cute. You can stop <laughs> into the tea shop and grab something and get a a little discount if you mention us, or if you're not in the area. You can order online and have it shipped directly to your house. If you'd like to get 10% off of an order for tea, marshmallows, cookies, they have really cute cups, um, accessories, just use BTC Pod when you're checking out. Or if you go into the store, mention the Bad Taste Crime podcast and you will get a discount. Yes. So that's BTC Pod. For discount online, um, that is at what is their website? Ch- uh, it is castingwhimsy.com. Castingwhimsy.com. Mm-hmm. Casting Casting. I have not made it in there yet, but I'm really looking forward to it because I'll tell you what, these guys have like kind of a nerdy bent on a lot of stuff that I'm Definitely. very here for. <laughs> yes, so, they name their teas, their tea blends, really funny names and cute names. It's really good. They have really great drinks if you go into the shop and get like a yeah. one of their handmade drinks. But I'm telling you, their cookies are where it's at. <laughs> I'm so excited to go to go up there and try them out. So with that, uh, we also have fringe coming up. Like, yeah, we do very soon. Like in a week, <laughs> <laughs> we did find out that we are doing an in person show live. Come see our faces. <laughs> I'm so excited. I'm so excited to just like be in front of you guys to be able to do a show. Yes. So you can hop on over to elginfringefestival.com to get a ticket or a pass. I highly suggest getting a pass because then you can go to yeah. all of the shows, anything you want to see. They will have some um, online as well as in person. And we are going to be playing the Blue Box Cafe, which is a Doctor Who themed cafe. In case it's you didn't awesome. know, I it's literally awesome. have it tattooed on my back. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we will be on at four thirty, and you can come and watch us. Tickets to just see us is five dollars, or you can buy a festival pass, which I believe is seventy bucks. Hold on. And this is, I don't know if you said it or not, but this is September 11th. Yes, September 11th, 430, Blue Box Cafe, downtown Elgin. So festival passes, that's good for the entire week, is $70. Um, If you just want a ticket to see us, it's five bucks. And you absolutely have to buy a button. The button is super important because all of these places that they're having these shows at are public spaces. They're restaurants, they're cafes, they're bars. You go in there with the button on, they know you're there for a show. The button is $3, and then you have your ticket. So don't forget to get your button and your ticket. You can order those online, or you can go downtown Elgin in person to Side Street Studio Arts and pick it up. You can do it the day of. You can do it a week before. They will have Fringe Central open, I believe, the entire week before Fringe starts. Or you can order online. You can pick up, have it delivered to you, however you want to do it. But that is where it's at. (laughs) 
Yes. Yeah, there's a lot of really great shows. There's a couple other podcasts. Uh, I think there's a ghost-themed one. Uh, There's one about snacks. Um, Ooh. Yeah, there's, there's like, some history. There's a magician. There's an illusionist. Yeah, they have – Fringe has, like, such a good (laughs) mix of, like, all sorts of – performance art actual art like janelle is there as a physical artist yes they do have a visual art show in the gallery space yeah. as well mm-hmm. yeah um lots of podcasts lots of, there's something comedy like there's something there for everybody really yes. um so we are definitely looking forward to that if you enjoyed this episode you can find more just like this at badtastepodcast.com there you can also find links to our merch if you need to pick some up or if you just want to support the show you can also find our donate page there i don't i think we covered everything for the end of the show yeah i think that's it i mean get some tea come on down to blue box and see us and this is a perfect time to to get some tea because we are rolling right into fall and before you know it I there know. is going to be snow on the ground oh my god so I, I have like an extensive collection of tea it's almost too much tea <laughs> yeah <laughs> um so go pick up some tea pick up your fringe pass um but we're gonna sign off for now but first we want to say um our sound and editing is by tiff fullman our music is by jason zakshevsky the enigma <laughs> This has been the Bad Taste Crime Podcast. We will see you in two weeks. Goodbye. Bye, folks. Left their bodies on the hillsides along the highway. It was as if a wave of evil washed over this town. We are all evil in some form or another. I feel like I said goodbye really weird. Like, goodbye. It sounded weird in my head.